Hello everyone, welcome to my Resident Evil Revelations 2 Survival Difficulty, No Healing Walkthrough. This is Claire 2, and that quote you heard at the beginning of this video is probably my favorite quote in the entire game. It's just funny, but it's not cringe like some of the quotes from Resident Evil 2 Remake or Resident Evil 1 Remake, or even like the original versions of Resident Evil 1 and 2. It's just funny. I don't know what it is, but Pedro's voice actor, the way he delivers that line while he's being chased by those afflicted, it just comes across as being memorable for all the right reasons, and I just think it's one of the few moments where this game can definitely shine with uh, very uh, goofy dialogue, because it complements a uh, character's personality, that just feels like something, uh, someone with a personality like Pedro would uh, say in that kind of moment, so that's why I like it. But Claire 2, the initial introduction to Claire 2, you're going to have to build up a lot of resources. And this is the first episode of the game where you'll actually see me utilize a very powerful exploit that helps balance out this part of the game, as well as in Claire 3. So there's this whole area that you're in called the Volsec area, and there's a central hub area, which is basically that building where we first started off in uh, Claire 2. And... There are other side buildings in the area where you can get supplies, and you have to go to them in order to gain access to a battery and some fuel. But because of the fact that that door animation you saw me doing just then, because of the fact that that animation exists, it allows you to do a very cheesy exploit against the enemies that I assume the developers want you to use. Because it's something that only occurs in certain areas of Claire 2 and Claire 3, and because of how isolated this whole exploit system is, and the fact that it's very easy to spot, it makes me think that the developers wanted you to use it. It's almost like in the original version of Resident Evil 3, where you know those exploits that you can use against Nemesis, where you can get him stuck around corners? Ayuma-san mentioned that QA had actually found this issue, but they left it in because, you know, they thought players would actually enjoy that. And it's the same with the quick shot technique, where you basically are able to fire your pistol at a faster fire rate if you press the aim button in a certain way, I think, or it must be uh, something you do with X. I, I don't know how it works, I'll have to look back at that video. But I believe uh, QA had actually discovered this trick you can do where you can quick shoot the pistol on Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3, the original versions, but they still left it in because they wanted players to uh, have a lot of fun with it when they actually found it. I mean, this is not something that just automatically makes such runs like knife only possible because, you know, a lot of people use uh, that exploit against Nemesis, for instance, in their knife only runs of the original version of Resident Evil 3, but it doesn't change the fact that that game is not designed for knife only. I mean, you can get most of it done knife only, but it just looks so stupid doing it, and it's just something that's befitting for people like Tynehard who just want to make the games look like they're 1% finished to somehow showcase the full potential of the game when. Resident Evil 3 definitely feels like the first Resident Evil game to embrace a lot of scenarios where the game really wants you to use a lot of weaponry. And the fact that they make you use the corner trick against Nemesis in place of a properly functioning dodge system against Nemesis, because the dodge on Resident Evil 3 is one of the worst dodges ever, even though it's better than Resident Evil Revelations dodge for sure, because the input is miles better than the input for Resident Evil Revelations. But the numerous times you do the dodge in the original version of Resident Evil 3 and you get hit while dodging because Jill does multiple different dodges for one single attack rather than one single dodge for one single attack. There were so many moments where Nemesis could hit you while you were dodging and it was so unfair. And pretty much it forced people to use the corner exploit to their advantage. But that still doesn't mean that because Ayumasan gives the green light for, oh, it, it actually is intentional, that doesn't automatically warn you doing this whole uh, stupid run of Resident Evil 3 where you just do knife only. Like, it's actually designed for it. But this feels different in this case because Resident Evil Revelations 2, when you're playing on the highest difficulties, the enemies have so much life, and at times it can be a little cheesy. And I do take a lot of damage in this episode of Resident Evil Revelations 2, and it was oftentimes damage that was completely unearned. Because the Walsic area, when you're actually doing that big siege moment in the Walsic area of uh, Claire 2, 
there is a big bug associated with the part where Gabe actually drops the ladder, and it's a problem that Resident Evil 6 had that represented a vast majority of the time that you were spent just getting screwed by poor designs. But during the cutscene that plays where Gabe drops the ladder, the enemies are moving during the cutscene. And so because they were moving during the cutscene and they were attacking me, I had no time to react to any of the enemies and they just got a cheap hit on me. And it was stuff like that that definitely warranted me doing a no healing walkthrough rather than a no damage walkthrough of Resident Revelations 2. Because this game definitely has problems, it definitely has rush development and you know, having to actually take the time to iron out a lot of the, the problems that this game has, that would have actually warranted a no damage walkthrough, but it's clear that because this was a side game, and side games don't have the same level of care as the main Resident Evil games, this is precisely why uh, the quality of this game is a lot lower than the other Resident Evil games in the mainline universe. So that is why I've opted to do no healing, because of shit like that. And, you know, this also leads me to justify why this exploit actually feels intentional, because the bosses on this game have so much life. The siege coming up, where you're having to defend yourself against the enemies, requires a lot of ammunition. And, weirdly, I don't get a lot of ammunition in this part. I think that's mainly because uh, Moira had a... Actually, wait, didn't I have a lot of pistol ammo in Moira's inventory? I, I don't know, I, I don't remember what it was like when I was uh, doing this. It's been a while since I've uh, done a, a recording of Resident Revelations 2 because I've been busy with work. But well, we'll see in the video. But the fact that this exploit only occurs in very specific areas and it's reserved as a way to allow you to increase your ammo and even when you don't have a lot of that ammo, even when you have a lot of the ammo, the bosses and the enemies can still take a huge beating. But just to not make the future fights look stupid, this is why I opt to do this exploit. Because again, it's a one-time exploit that's reserved for very specific areas and allows you to farm a lot of resources. And let me explain how this works. So that door animation that you saw me doing, where I just went through that door, that is key to this exploit because, for some reason, when you go through this door, if you're inside this building, the enemies, after a certain amount of time, will be alerted to you and they will try to come into the building by going through the door, but obviously they can't because it's a loading door and enemies are not supposed to go through loading doors. But when you go through the loading door and you're going outside, the enemies are paused and they're in a stealth status, but they're actually uh, bugged in a sense. Or rather, they're very uh, late to actually resume a combat status against you, even though they can literally see you. And during this time when they're in that stealth profile, you can get behind them and do a sneak attack, which is something I forgot to mention about Resident Evil Revelations 2. This is really the first Resident Evil game to have a dedicated stealth system, as in like very unique animations uh, specific to stealth. I'm not talking about like stealth situations like in Resident Evil 6, where you know, like the, the characters were still in the combat status, and a lot of the animations that you do for stealth attacks are uh, reused uh, combat assets. And I'm not talking about stuff like that, I'm talking about very unique animations uh, specific to stealth, like crouching and being able to do sneak attacks on the enemies. So that is a brand new feature that they've added to Resident Evil Revelations 2 to showcase the development of these characters uh, due to how much they fought BOWs. And obviously uh, they'll have developed a huge skill set because of how much they've actually dealt with BOWs, and I like the fact that they're portraying it here. And stealth is so powerful because the enemies on this game can take a beating. And some of the enemies can be very bullshit, which is why it's better to use stealth against them, which is what the developers were intending, because a lot of stealth games, they like to make their enemies nuisances in combat scenarios in order to make you use stealth, which not much I'm going to really like critique right there, because you know if it's such a established criteria in a lot of games, then there's really no point in giving it a lot of fault. But... This stealth system is what allows this exploit to work. See this guy? You see how he was delayed for a couple of seconds and now he's coming to get me and he can't get through the door? So I go through the door, he's in a stealth status and this allows me to do a sneak attack on him. And that right there, Pedro can go through the door with you and at times he can get in the way because as long as that door is open, you can't initiate this animation. And at times you'll see that. Did you see how uh, Claire was backed up a bit because uh, Pedro pushed her with the door? Well, the sneak attacks on this game, because of the fact that it's two separate animations and positioning of yourself and the enemy is actually a factor to consider. I mean, Claire will automatically target the enemy in order to do the, the stab attack on the ground. 
And the thing is, is that if she is displaced from her initial position when you first start the kick animation, there are times when it can miss. But it's very rare for that to happen, and it only really happens under very specific scenarios where you're just being pushed by something else entirely. So you don't have to worry about it so much. But sometimes the, the sneak attack is not the one that kill. It's cool that it's the one that kill on a lot of the enemies on this game, but if you want to do a lot more damage with your sneak attacks, you need to upgrade a skill called the follow-up attack, which is essentially that move you can give to Claire and Barry that allows them to finish off enemies on the ground, even when you're in a combat status. But by upgrading the follow-up attack, you are able to deal increased damage with your sneak attacks against certain high tiered enemies, like this Iron Head right here. This Iron Knight will always go down regardless of what your upgrade is for the follow-up attack, but later on there will be situations where if your follow-up attack is, say for instance, at level 1, you will not be able to instantly kill Iron Heads, which shouldn't be a big deal, because you can just mash R2 uh, before they get into a combat status where they're trying to get off off the ground to initiate the, the follow-up attack. So the combination of the sneak attack and the follow-up attack will allow you to take down Iron Heads. And Ether mentioned to me that he doesn't like the Iron Heads on this game, and there is some justification to this because the Iron Heads in combat scenarios, they take a huge beating and in the struggle DLC on this game, which kind of forces you to do a lot of uh, combat scenarios against these enemies. They can be very annoying, and they don't get knocked over by the shotgun, unfortunately, because they're a big enemy, even though I personally feel they should get knocked over. There's nothing really special about these big enemy types that should allow them to ignore the shotgun, or at least a shot to the leg should do something, but... Iron Heads don't really flinch that much, and their weakness is the head area. Like, the parts of their skin that are very red around the head and around their chest area. Those are the parts that deal increased damage. But, like I said, I do understand some of the justification for hating the Iron Heads on this game, but a lot of the times with Resident Revelations 2, they make you deal with the Iron Heads in stealth scenarios, and also, you can easily finish them off using your bottles. So, because of the fact that the game is already giving you these options, which falls into the baseline way to play Resident Revelations 2, that's why I'm not so hard on the Iron Heads, and compared to Resident Evil Village, compared to Resident Evil Village, the Iron Heads are better designed than every single enemy in Resident Evil Village, because are even fighting enemies in Resident Evil Village, like, just, just judging those enemies based on Villager Shadows difficulty, which is the difficulty mode that showcases what the developers truly valued in their gameplay experience, if they want to bloat the enemy HP to an absurd degree, if they want to remove fundamental flinch animations, if they want to put in so many enemies in single areas, if they want you to rely upon exploits, if they want you to simply run past enemies just mindlessly, and to almost convey the fact that why do you bother rearranging the enemies when you're just going to be forcing the player to run past enemies? That game leaves so much to desire, just so many questions with regards to how they design the enemies on that game. Like, Resident Evil Village, in all honesty, might have the worst enemy design I have ever seen for a Resident Evil game. Mine is like Resident Evil 1 Remake and Resident Evil 2 Remake and Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 2 because those enemies were very forgettable. You just ran right past them because the developers didn't really devote a lot of time to that because they wanted to embrace the whole idea of speedrunning. And the thing is that when you design games for speedrunning, you end up sacrificing a lot of uh, time and dedication to actually making your enemies lethal. And because they designed those games for speedrunning, that's why they make it where the enemies are very bullshit and at times they don't have the best designs to make them feel capable of actually dealing with you. So instead, the developers inflate their uh, abilities to an absurd degree to make them cheat, and that is why it is better to not waste time with that. So that is why I'm like, what enemies? That, that's what I literally say whenever someone is talking to me about enemies in those games. It's like, those enemies don't even feel like enemies. The game is forcing you to just run right past them. And running past them just feels a lot more optimized and actually engaging with them because the weapons on those games are just very boring to use and hardly practical. But that's just what I mean when I say that Resident Evil Village, out of all the Resident Evil games that actually have enemies worth discussing and you actually feel like enemies it feels like the worst resident evil game in terms of enemy designs of course maybe resident evil relations can fall into that category as well because a lot of the enemies they forced you to have a lot of customization kits in order to do a lot of high damage to them and given how much the game really encourages you to use the sniper rifle to balance out a lot of the, the dumb designs although technically like in those side missions where you're playing as other characters and you're not dealing with the rpg designs that's a little different, 
So based on that and the idea that Resident Revelations offers uh, an upgrade system that actually affords you a lot of creativity and you know, like finding these damage upgrades feels a lot more uh, befitting for the grounded nature to survival horror than purchasing a bunch of upgrades from some guy who feels like a gameplay mechanic given human form. Resident Revelations definitely has a, a better enemy arrangement compared to Resident Evil Village. And really, I just don't understand what they were trying to do with Resident Evil Village. There's a reason why I say that the identity of Resident Evil Village is seriously confused. Because it juggles between Resident Evil 1 Remake's idea of enemies and Resident Evil 4's ideas of enemies. And the mix-up of those different mentalities just caused the enemies to be so confused and poorly designed and poorly implemented. And just the false messaging that new Capcom tried to deliver with their combat scenarios, like that stronghold like an encounter, like that easily could be the perfect scenario to represent the fundamental failure in good game design for Resident Evil Village. It's just so mind-boggling that they could make this many mistakes with a mainline Resident Evil title that you'd expect in a side game. And I know that Polkit Sharma already clarified that the whole rumor that Resident Evil Village was originally Resident Evil Revelations 3 is not true. But just based on the lacking quality displayed with Resident Evil Village, it really feels like it was meant to be a side game at some point before becoming a main game. Unlike Resident Evil 7, like people want to say Resident Evil 7 is a side game, but like what the fuck are you talking about? At least it actually does things that are a lot more interesting than the older Resident Evil games. And it ties in greatly to the main story because it introduces Blue Umbrella and the idea of the mold being a severe threat. And like you're, you're looking at the aftermath of the Lan Chang incident and the sea virus. And, you know, it was a bold move on old Capcom's part, but they seriously delivered Resident Evil 7, not just in terms of story, not just in terms of uniqueness with the characters, like actually introducing a new roster of characters, but also in terms of gameplay. There was no confusion whatsoever with Resident Evil 7's identity. It understood what it was trying to be. It was trying to be a Resident Evil game. It was not trying to be a survival horror game purely. It was not trying to be... I mean, when I say purely, I mean, like, it was not trying to be a uh, survival horror game of the 1990s or something. Thing, or trying to be like a, a combat game like we get with a Not Hero DLC or the Endazori DLC. I mean, it was trying to be a Resident Evil game with the intelligent blending of those mentalities to create not a survival horror game, not an action game, but a Resident Evil game. Resident Evil as in, it's a genre. Like, Resident Evil at this point feels like a genre. Like, Evil Within is a Resident Evil game. Last of Us is a Resident Evil game. Dead Space could be a Resident Evil game as well, in terms of the kind of mentalities those games favor that fall in line with what a true Resident Evil game is. And that's what we got with the likes of Resident Evil 4, 5, uh, 6, 7, um, like certain games like uh, Resident Evil 3 Remake, even though it didn't really embrace it to such a heavy degree because it still had the holes of Resident Evil 2 Remake. Or like with the original version of Resident Evil 3, even though that game definitely has a lot of problems that bring it down in quality. Or like with Resident Revelations and... Revelations 2, even though Revelations 2 definitely leaves a lot to be desired, this and that, but at least these games, despite some of the problems that they had, minus Resident Evil 7, of course, because Resident Evil 7 is fucking flawless, I will always stand by that. Like, aside from the problems that these games had, they had the proper mentalities associated with being a Resident Evil game, and such mentalities were also apparent in games like Dead Space, Last of Us, and Evil Within. And that's what I mean when I say Resident Evil's become a genre at this point, and it's absolutely amazing that Capcom could do wonders with the Resident Evil series to really make it stand out as this very important game series in gaming history, but then new Capcom completely ruined it with Resident Evil 2 Remake and onward. It's really sad. But I completely lost what I was trying to say earlier, but I'll get back to it when I get the chance. So right now, we have this really uh, annoying sequence. So that first uh, siege encounter that we did with the enemies is fun, because the enemies die fast. And once again, Ether, why are you saying that the afflicted are better, I'm sorry, not better, but they're worse than the lichens? How on earth are the afflicted possibly worse than the lichens when they go down so fast from the pistol and the game is actually encouraging you to be intelligent with your upgrades and with your ammunition and the like? Like, these enemies actually die fast because it makes a lot of sense. It makes sense realistically. These developers had a greater amount of respect for their enemies and because they even put in a sequence like this. Like, you don't see any kind of siege sequence like this in Resident Evil Village aside from the initial introduction with the Lycans. And the only reason that siege even exists in Resident Evil Village is to make you stumble through that mess of a section just to eventually discover that you can use a barricade to your advantage to actually stay up on enough ammunition to keep the enemies at bay and then you have to glitch out one of the enemies like it's all there 
as this cheap path towards figuring out that the barricade serves as a next play, whereas here, the developers are actually reveling in the design that they've actually favored with that seed section, where they want you to actually deal with these enemies that are better designed for the sequence. Like, the reason why that sequence exists is because of the designs put in place with the afflicted, where they actually flinch from your shots. They actually flinch from a shotgun. They die so fast because they make sense given their capabilities. Like, they don't have such absurdities like the Lycans do. Like, how, how the hell can the Lycans take so many shots before they go down? And I've even showcased this to people who have never played a game before. And they have looked at how much HP the Lycans have with the amount of shots I'm pumping into their heads on Village of Shadows difficulty. And they're like, why are they not dead? Like, when it's leading to that much confusion in the single layman who has never even played a game before, then it's clear that new Capcom done fucked up with their enemy designs in Resident Evil Village compared to this game. Like, this game definitely doesn't have the best enemy designs, but come on, Ether. There is no way the Afflicted are worse than the Lycans. I don't know where you've got that idea from, but I'd be really curious to hear your uh, dissection of the enemy designs in this game compared to the enemies in Resident Evil Village, because... I think you got your your roles reversed right there, dude. <laughs> That's what I'll say right there, the ether. But it's still absurd that he made that kind of statement that just shook my world, shook my gaming world and logical mind when he said that the afflicted are worse than the lichens. And maybe they're worse on Claire 3, I don't know. Like, I, I remember my experiences with Claire 3. But the game already offers you so many different ways of actually bypassing the poor designs, albeit with methods that might seem a little bit weird and the like, but at least they're methods that allow you to bypass the poor designs. It's a shame the same can't be said with that seed sequence, because during that whole cutscene where Neil was trying to lower the ladder, the enemies were moving during the cutscene, so I had no idea where the enemies were. I spun around trying to get away, and one of the enemies clipped me because it's bullshit. How the hell did they miss that in Q&A? It makes no sense. That is Resident Evil 6 design in a game that doesn't even have the same level of high-octane gameplay as Resident Evil 6. It's more so like trying to take a slower approach to make it more like a survival horror game in the, like superficially. And it has this kind of problem that existed in Resident Evil 6 and during Excella's boss fight on Resident Evil 5. What the fuck is that about? But at least this is a great design. These dogs, the dogs on this game are one of the best dog enemies ever made in the entire Resident Evil series because they flinch from your bullets and they go down so fast. This is exactly how a dog should be designed in a Resident Evil game. I love the dogs in the original version of Resident Evil 1, even though they got iframes while they were busy rising above the ground so it forced you to delay your shots. I like the dogs in Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil 3, Resident Evil Code Veronica. I, mean, I didn't even deal with the gold meals in Resident Evil 4 because as much as they did go down very quickly and you could hit them out of the air to knock them over, they were so dangerous because they were very evasive and it was just better to run right past them because dealing with them was a waste of time and it was very simple to do. The dogs in Resident Evil 5, they definitely had problems like not flinching during that whole animation when they're mutated into the Ajules where uh, they fire their tentacles at you from their mouth, and they, they don't flinch whatsoever, which is bullshit. And they have a little too much life, if you ask me, and plus their mutation can regenerate their life, which is stupid. The dogs in Resident Evil 6, if you counter them, they died instantly. And you only encounter them in Chapter 1, Chapter 2, and... Yeah, that was it. You, you only encounter them in those specific chapters, in Leon 1 and Leon 2. Of course, it was annoying how uh, they were very resilient to a lot of uh, high-powered weapons and they didn't really flinch very well from the shotgun and the like, but at least the counter-attack was useful in actually knocking them over and actually finishing them off. And if you shot them out of the air, they would always fall over. Like, those dogs were pretty cool. Resident Revelations dogs, because you had the shotgun, they went down very quickly, but they had some very odd AI to them, which could make them very uh, perplexing to deal with. And because of their awkward nature, that just gave them a lot of awkward chances to get the drop on you. So, not the most impressive dog enemy type, but these dogs are absolutely exceptional. Resident Evil 1 Remake is really the, the one Resident Evil game that has the worst dog enemies. Not only did the dogs not flinch from anything, but they had the ability to do this long-range jump attack that allowed them to turn in midair, and they were just so frustrating to deal with when they would constantly damage you, and they constantly grabbed you, and you were trying your best to counter them by just shooting them out of the air, but because of... 
just how quickly they attack you and with how slow your animations were. The dogs had so many opportunities to cheat in Resident Evil and Remake. And you spend more time just running right past them because of how poorly designed they were and how broken they were. And because of how much the game was designed around uh, knife only, you had to take the path of least resistance by running past them and just taking advantage of their really odd AI system, which is complementary to the whole idea of speedrunning because that game is designed solely for speedrunning and not to be a game worth replaying multiple times. Of course, a lot of people will disagree with me on this because people will try to come up with many different reasons for actually wanting to replay Resident Evil 1 Remake, but rather absurd reasons, if you ask me. But thank God the dogs on this game do not follow Resident Evil 1 Remake's style of dogs. They still follow like the same trend that you get with a lot of Resident Evil games where the dogs are really well designed. And even Resident Evil 2 Remake had really good dog enemies, but again, there was no incentive to deal with them because that game was designed for knife only. And the dogs in Resident Evil 3 remake, you only encounter them like once. <laughs> One time. And you killed them by basically using a generator to shock them and then finishing them off with your pistol. So, nothing to really critique right there. But basically what I'm saying is the dogs on this game are a really good enemy type. They're complementary to Resident Evil ideology. They're complementary to good game design. They flinch from your shots. They have the right amount of life to not feel like such an absurd enemy like in Resident Evil Village's case. Their physical capabilities are actually complementary to how quickly they die, and it makes so much fucking sense compared to Resident Evil Village. Like, again, I'm going to say it, Resident Evil Village has the worst enemy design I've ever seen, and this is among the Resident Evil games that actually have enemies that are actually enemies, not like Resident Evil 1 Remake and Resident Evil 2 Remake. But just as a whole... Resident Evil Village had no idea what it was doing with its enemies, and they probably had thoughts like this, and this eventually bled into the actual gameplay format that they decided to favor with these enemies, where it's like, what the fuck are you doing with your enemies when you're going to be making the Lycans cheat by just having that really bullshit forward attack of theirs that just get, allows them so much forward momentum, and you can't even dodge it even though it looks like you should, and then you give them an off-screen attack where if you put them off camera, they bypass the whole animation of actually uh, pulling out their weapon, and so they immediately skip into a, a weapon attack that just gives them so much forward momentum, and it's a three-hit combo as if that wasn't bad enough. And then they make it where they're completely resilient to the shotgun. Like, those shotgun animations that you had in the previous difficulties where they actually knocked over from a shotgun blast and they actually fell to the ground, they're completely lost on Village of Shadows difficulty unless you get a point-blank shot to their head with the shotgun to make them do that whole animation that is very specific to actually using the shotgun on their head. It's not some knockdown animation, it's just a knockdown animation that is... It's tailored to them being hit in the head. That's really what it is. It's not that special of a knockdown animation, and the detection on the spread of the shotgun can get you fucked so many times when dealing with the Lycans on that game. That's not even mentioning that the Lycans have the ability to cancel their flinch animation to actually dodge, because that's how sensitive the program dodges for allowing the Lycans to dodge your shots, and it's so bullshit to the point of just cancelling animations. Like, why even bother putting in that flinch animation if you're going to be giving them the ability to cancel that animation? And then you have this really stupid counter system that they decided to favor Resident Evil Village where you shoot them in the head before they have a chance to hit you. But the thing is that the detection is so shit because you have to be at a lower elevation compared to the Lycan. And you have to make sure you do not put your camera off of them. The camera has to stay on the Lycan at all times. Like when they're doing the running attack, for instance, that, that running grab of theirs. What I often try to do when dealing with the running grab is I put them off camera the moment they start running because if I'm looking at them while they're doing the running grab, they'll evade. But when I have them off camera just slightly and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at them at an angle to either the left or to the right, they will always run. They will never evade. But when I do it like that, for some reason, it magically cancels out the ability to counter their attack by shooting them in the head. So why is it that this counter system against the Lycans is filled with so many niggles, so many weird designs that should have been properly ironed out to even warrant the existence of this mechanic when it's going to be this clunky? Like, how is this possible? So wh why are they trying to deliver, once again, a mechanic that serves absolutely no purpose when it's just better off to not have that mechanic in the first place? Like, when are you ever going to see me utilize that counter mechanic that's so fucking useless? Like, what even is the whole point of it? The moment you kick them away, 
right? The enemies, the other enemies just pretty much uh, stop attacking you, and they wait for the guy you just kicked to actually recover. But when you shoot them, they immediately jump backwards to recover instantly from the animation. And when you shoot them with the sniper rifle to the head while they're busy being kicked back, they immediately cancel whatever animation they're doing just to walk towards you and just hit you. Bullshit. Fucking bullshit. And again, Ether wants to say that the afflicted are worse than the lichens with the amount of poor designs that I've just explained. It's almost about as absurd as uh, one comment that I heard from Ether. So Ether mentioned that he doesn't like the sprint counter on Resident Evil 7, and I just have to ask why. Because the sprint counter is only an issue if you're being an idiot. Like I'm not, I'm not calling Ether an idiot, of course. I mean, I'm just I'm I'm doing it from a more friendly standpoint, but. Like, to even, like, sprint past an enemy in Resident Evil 7, this only applied to the molded and the bladed molded. But, you know, they had the ability to do a one-frame sprint counter on you in case you were being very stupid and trying to run away. But this is what allowed you to just walk away from them, and it wasn't so much of a fucking issue compared to the four momentum achieved by these lichens and the inability to dodge their very first weapon attack. Like, that attack that the Lycans do with their off-screen attack and also with their first attack on their uh, weapon combo, when they're not doing the off-screen attack, those attacks are so fucking bullshit. Really bullshit. And it's all there to complement the Resident Evil 1 remake mentality of running past them because he wanted to use poor designs to bypass the enemies. Yet, these enemies are placed in environmental situations that are befitting for Resident Evil 4. And then you have the Stronghold Lycan encounter, which feels like a section from Resident Evil 4 where it feels like they want you to fight the enemies with really crappy combat. And, oh, by the way, right here. I have my character set to wait, but for some reason they're moving. This is a great example of when the commands don't work on this game. When the wait command is going to not work properly and your characters are still moving, what even is the whole point of having this kind of mechanic? That's really dumb. But going back to what I was saying, you have combat scenarios like the Stronghold Lycan Encounter that feel like they want you to fight, but you've been going through the full entire game just running past these enemies because of their poor designs and dealing with their very shitty combat systems and shitty animations and the like, that it just leads to so much confusion as to what you're supposed to do. And eventually you develop so much of our frustration towards the, the section and to the enemies that you just run right past them. This is exactly what I did in my blind playthrough. And I wasn't even on Village of Shadows difficulty, I was on Hardcore difficulty. And even though the enemies have a reasonable amount of life in Hardcore difficulty, and they actually have realistic animations compared to Village of Shadows difficulty, even though the animations are still kind of shit in Hardcore difficulty anyway, I still had to go through the whole process of using exploits and using, like, cheap running tactics in order to actually bypass the enemies in that section because the section just didn't understand what it was trying to do the developers had no care in the world when understanding how to place the enemies properly they didn't understand how to program the whole situation where lichens are climbing on walls or using vines or jumping between pillars and when you're going to be encountering the situation of lichens getting stuck in the geometry all the time if you're going to be encountering this kind of problem then it's clear that the developers don't want you to fight in that section, yet in the concept art they said they want you to fight in that section, but you've completely contradicted your own self with the way you've designed that section on Hardcore and Village of Shadows difficulty, and again, Ether, with the amount of confusion displayed by new Capcom, with the way they designed the Lycans, how can you say the Afflicted are worse than the Lycans? And let's look at the other enemies as well. We have the Moriekas. So the Moriekas on Villager Shadows difficulty, they don't flinch whatsoever. I mean, it's two shotgun shells before they flinch, but fighting them is a waste of time. So it's just better to uh, block their grabs and kick them away, or just run right past them and use the sprint counter to your advantage. And all this kind of stuff. Oh, and speaking of which, uh, I, was, I forgot to mention, but this whole situation where Ether hates the sprint counter from Resident Evil 7, I wonder what he hates more. The sprint counter from Resident Evil 7, or the four momentum achieved by the Lycans with their off-screen attack and also with their normal attacks as well. Like, those attacks are worse than the sprint counter from Resident Evil 7. The sprint counter's not even an issue in Resident Evil 7, so... I feel like Ether hates the sprint counter in Resident Evil 7 more than the bullshit attacks that the Lycans can do, and that's what it came across as when I read his comment, <laughs> which was rather funny to hear. But again, I'm not doing it to be uh, an asshole towards Ether because Ether's still awesome, and he's not a freaking Tynehard. He's nowhere near as deluded as Tynehard is, because he at least maintains some morals when actually uh, playing his games. He maintains some integrity when doing his runs. But I still can't believe he finds the afflicted worse than the Lycans, and like the, the Moriekos are a throwaway enemy overall in Resident Evil Village. The Varkalaks are a cool enemy. I love their appearance. They're definitely the scariest enemy in Resident Evil Village. But there's no incentive to fight them because they have too much life. 
but at least they have a cool design where you can shoot them out of the air with a shotgun because it's not dependent upon arbitrary damage values, it's dependent upon the state the enemy is in. So you shoot them at the right time with the shotgun to knock them back, which is a really cool design and something that only Resident Evil would do in no other series. But again, there is no incentive to fight them, they're a throwaway enemy. And then you have the Samkas where you just run right past them in that first combat scenario and then you never see them again after Castle Dumitresk and they're a waste of time to fight. And then you have the uh, the soldats, and the soldats are throw away. I mean, you just run right past them with the flash grenades, but you're not really thinking about it because you're enjoying the section overall, because the designs of Heisenberg's factory actually feel befitting for the actual true mentalities of Resident Evil Village, which is more like Resident Evil 1 Remake, and using the flash grenades feels satisfying in that whole section. And then you have the armored lichens, which are a throwaway enemy, and you never encounter them at all in Resident Evil Village, aside from a couple of moments in the Strongo Lichen encounter, but they're just placed there on Villager Shadow's difficulty just because they don't actually offer any sort of obstacle or any kind of threat at all. You just bypass them the same way you would on Hardcore difficulty if there weren't any uh, armored lichens there. Like, this, is, this is yet again... A great example of a confused developer doing a confused action with even opting to rearrange the enemies on Resident Evil Village when the enemy placements are so negligible on Village of Shadows difficulty. Like, there's nothing negligible about the, about the enemies here. At least in the combat scenarios with the Afflicted and also with the Revenants, they give a justification for fighting them. They put in actual combat scenarios, like mandatory combat encounters that force you to deal with the enemies to really make sure you're stocking up on your ammunition to prepare yourself for these sections. The enemies on this game don't feel so throwaway compared to Resident Evil Village. And again, I, I don't understand Ether's reasoning for liking the Lycans a lot more than the Afflicted. It's so puzzling. Like, Ether, I really wish you'd leave a comment on this video right now, or at least comment when I do um, the, the live replay of this whole entire video, because I need to understand your point of view, because it really doesn't make any sense to me why you feel the Afflicted are worse than the Lycans. I mean, yes, they have poor designs, but they're nowhere near as poor in their designs and implementation as the Lycans are in Resident Evil Village. There is no feasible way that what you're saying is logical. It's, it's hard to comprehend, Ether. Like, I, I just wish you'd um, voice your comment right here. But th that's all I have to say for the moment. It's just something that Resident Evil Revelations 2 does a lot better than Resident Evil Village, and it's so disappointing for a side game to somehow be better than a mainline Resident Evil title. But again, Resident Evil Village should have been delayed, but of course, delaying a game presents with more financial consequences than actually releasing a broken product, a very confused game. Like, the developers can delude themselves all they want, and they may have their deluded fan base backing them up, but they can't fool a true Resident Evil player like myself who actually analyzes these games at a scientific level and on a technological level and on a mentality level. And this is precisely why everything I am saying about Resident Evil Village is fact. The level of confusion, just the amount of poor mentalities associated with Resident Evil Village, it has to be spoken about, and I'm the only person who's actually committed to it. And it'll never stop, guys. I mean it. It'll never stop. But I'll continue this tangent in some other video. Right now, we have a boss fight. We're dealing with an enemy type known as the Vulcan Blubber, and you can take out these two enemies with stealth attacks, only I'm not able to get this guy because he moves away too quickly. But this is a fun encounter if you have damage to on your uh, machine pistol. And it definitely feels like a Resident Evil fight when you have the correct tools at your disposal. You've actually scoured the environment correctly for ammunition and customization kits. But what you need to do is you need to put a decoy bottle to the side of this Vulcan Blubber, and you cannot shoot him during the initial animation. You have to wait until your reticle turns white on his head to know when his hitbox is active. But while he's turning around, you can then shoot him in the head, and he'll be busy trying to uh, turn, and then he has to beat on his drum. But by then, he should already be dead from the machine pistol. I mean, I had to use my shotgun a bit because I missed a couple of my shots with the machine pistol. But that right there is intelligent use of my ammunition and my customization kits in order to do this fun encounter. And the game respected the creativity involved with using my ammunition and my customization kits intelligently by allowing me to actually kill this guy very quickly because it's realistic, because it makes actual fucking sense, because it's a survival horror game, because it's a game that actually understands how to not drag out its scenarios. Unlike Resident Evil Village, where even when you slot into the merchant, the enemies take so much of a beating before they actually go down. This right here is a fight where the developers actually understood what they were trying to do. I mean, of course, uh, if you don't have the machine pistol ammo or you don't have damage too, it's a big problem, but I can't imagine why you would ever miss out on these customization kits. But that right there is a great example of why Resident Evil Village just doesn't hold a candle to this game when it comes to its gameplay format. 
I mean, there are still other parts of Resident Evil Village that I like more so than Resident Revelations 2. And I still find Village to be a lot more fun than Revelations 2. But there's no denying that Revelations 2, in this case right here, displays less confusion and more intelligence compared to every other section of Resident Evil Village. And Ether, you cannot disagree with me right there. There is no possible way you're going to counter that with somehow saying that Resident Evil Village actually handles a better gameplay format than this game right here with this section. This is a section that actually feels like it's befitting for an actual human being, like a human being designed this section, not like some alien life form from another planet whose mentalities operate on a very different level as to be on the realm of stupidity in the human realm. This right here was designed by someone with brains and actual creativity. Like, this right here is a section that it feels befitting for our survival horror game. It feels befitting for a Resident Evil game. And sadly, this same mentality doesn't apply to a lot of sections later on in Revelations 2. So, I know I'm treating it like it's a big deal right now. As if it's somehow a major thing in the game. But, believe me guys, it's not going to be the same case in Revelations 2. But at least it, it tries, you know? At least its main enemy encounters are a lot better than the boss fights of this game. The boss fights on this game are shit. But that right there... You could call it a boss fight, but the Vulcan Blubber is an enemy you could actually encounter outside of the boss realm. And in this context, it's well designed, but the Vulcan Blubber, as Ether says, has a lot of problems. And I do agree that the Vulcan Blubber has a lot of problems on this game. It is a very cheesy enemy. It has infinite ammo inside of its drum because what it does is it will fire fireballs at you. It basically ignites whatever is inside that drum in order to fire at you, and it fires an infinite amount of projectiles without any way of actually stopping it. It has infinite ammo, like I just said, and the tracking on these fireballs doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think what they're doing is they're tracking you based on the path you're taking, not directly at you, but even then, there are times where it doesn't make any sense. And given the sheer amount of life the Vulcan Blubbers have, if you don't slot into the correct resources, and on the Struggle DLC, that is not even going to be the case, and that's where the Vulcan Blubbers' poor designs really start to show themselves. The Vulcan Blubbers can be a lot more bullshit than some of the enemies in Resident Evil Village, that's for sure. I think that's definitely one thing Ether and I can agree on. The Vulcan Blubbers are one of the worst enemy types ever made in the Resident Evil series. They have too much life, they have really awkward hitboxes, they spam those fireballs like crazy, and... There's just nothing you can do creatively against that enemy aside from using a decoy bottle and the machine pistol like what I just did here. But this only applies to this Vulcan Blubber because the next couple of Vulcan Blubbers, they will have increased life. I mean, actually, uh, there's only one other Vulcan Blubber. Oh, no, there's two of them, actually. There's one inside the meat factory, and then there's another one in the sewer area, and you can just avoid the both of them. Because the environments that they put you in, it's clear they don't want you to deal with that enemy. And I instead rely upon other methods for actually bypassing them, and that's when the decoy bottles really come in handy. But I don't know if I can put this enemy into the realm of, oh, they want you to run right past it because it's a poorly designed enemy. They're using poor designs to justify that. Or maybe because of the fact that it's a special enemy type, and it has all these characteristics, and that kind of justifies the whole idea of running right past them. And it, they don't really want you to fight the enemy, but then when you have them in the struggle DLC, that really presents as a bit of a confusing uh, mentality right there. So I don't know how best to place my stance against that enemy, but I'd rather not dwell on it. But that right there is the end of Claire 2, and it's a pretty simple episode. I don't see you having a lot of troubles with that particular episode if you follow the strategies like how I just did it. And, you know, I think the game overall, it handles itself a lot better than Resident Evil Village because it knows how to actually ramp things up and when to not ramp things up compared to Resident Evil Village. And there's no kind of conflicting mentalities right there. This game, for the most part, is a very grounded Resident Evil game. It's a slower-paced Resident Evil game with occasional high-octane moments. And it's that leash on the creativity and on the developer's abilities to do things a little bit absurd that allows this game to be a very simple Resident Evil game and also a pretty easy Resident Evil game if you're actually uh, playing the game intelligently and you're slotting into the right upgrades and you're slotting into the right customization kits and you're slotting into the right weapons. Still doesn't change the fact that Revelations 2 has a lot of problems and at times it doesn't feel as creative as some of the other Resident Evil games and there are those broken enemies and there are definitely moments where this game can feel about as boring as Resident Evil 2 Remake but I'll save those for when they actually appear in the videos. 
But that is the end of this episode. Stay tuned for the future episodes. Thank you all for watching, and you take care now.